telling some people to to come on to this one instead of instead of my site. Okay. I'm going to set the recorder just in case, but hopefully you guys are, Jackson, hopefully you're recording as well. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, hold on, I'm going to end the recording for a second. I just want to clarify what you're saying, Jackson. Uh, you said maybe down 5% yeah. a little clipping. Are you talking about the, the, the sound? Is it, is it still too loud? Mike, you want me to turn it down? I'll turn it down to 80 that's good. Oh, the, are you saying that the mic is not good quality? Is it? Is it? It's good is now. It like it's good. It's good. in the sound quality. It's no, perfect. You're fine. Volume was up too high. You're fine now. Um, I have, I'm not sure, Jackson. Before we start, what, what do we what do we have here? We have there's four different tabs. I see speaker. That's me. Moderator. You. And then there's having question. And then guest. What's the having question? Why do I see that? I don't know. She's here. What's your question, Julie? Well, I'm not sure what that is. But it's she's questionable. Anyways, I'll not start. I don't know if you set the recording. So Jackson invited me to speak for you guys, for those who attended his boot camp uh, event in Florida, but also for other people who were not able to attend in person, but who want to participate in the study or the teaching through the internet. They also were invited to do this teaching. And so basically what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be discussing the canon, the Bible canon today, and it's probably going to be about an hour to an hour and a half long, or you know, however long Jackson feels it should be. You know, if we have to end it earlier for your guys' time constraints, then we will. Uh, so, what I'm intending to do is just to give the basic presentation of mine, and then if we have some time left over, perhaps I can ask, I can have you guys ask questions about the canon, because I've been studying the canon. For many years, I've been since 2009 is when I first started diving into the canon, and ever since then I've obsessed with the, uh, the whole thing, yeah, uh, studying that issue and thinking about it more than pretty much any other issue. So that's been that's been my like years now, and so I'm very much a self. Uh, I, I I would I would consider myself an expert on the on the issue of canon, but it wasn't through you know, school institutions, but it was just through my own research, my own study, and you who are leading me, I believe he was leading me to find and accept these writings, and so I'm going to share a little bit about what I've seen about the canon, hopefully help convince you guys that about the canon, uh, what I believe about the canon, but also to help other people see, because your eyes may be open, but other people's <coughs> eyes are still closed, and you might be having a hard time convincing them to open their eyes on this. I'm still having a very hard time because you can have the perfect argument, but if someone does not want to be open to the idea, they'll never change their mind, even if you have all the evidence, all the arguments. So uh, the best we can do is I'll just share with you some helpful information, and then you can try to use it with some people and see it, if that helps or not. It's going to help with some people, but many people it won't. So first I'm going to mention about uh, the words, the words used, the word canon, that comes from the Greek and it was used to basically mean a rule or a order, a system of uh, organization. And it, according to a lot of the scholars, there is not 100% agreement on this, but generally they, they, they say that this word canon actually comes from a Hebrew word in origin, which means read, this Hebrew word kena, something like that. And kena in Hebrew means like a read, and in the Greek it was used, kena was used to mean like a measuring rod, or a read, which is used to measure things. It's, and as we see today, the canon of the Bible was a system of measuring what's what scripture, what's not, and then using the scripture to measure what truth is and, and such of that. But it was used for many other many other concepts too, not just the Bible, but the, the churches would use it to refer to their organizations, their their rules, their codes of conduct. 
their canons. And and so that's the kind of the origin of that term. Now I also want to discuss the origin of the term apocrypha. This is also a Greek word in origination. The original meaning of apocrypha actually meant secret, secret, or mystery, or hidden. And the original understanding or idea of this was that certain truths, certain things are hidden from, from most people. So it actually had a very positive meaning originally it, when, it, when that word first began to be used. And later on, it started to be used as a pejorative. It's kind of like I, I often think of things that first come to my mind, and one of the things that just comes to my mind for for language, yeah, it's one of the most common ones I like to look at, and that's the word gay. Because in the older sense, the original sense, it meant more like happy. And then later on, it, it, got, it received a negative connotation based on how people were using it. They were using it to refer to homosexual people, and why was that? Because homosexual people were living a very hedonistic lifestyle. They were focused on pleasure and happiness and making their body gay or joyful. And so that was how the term caught on and how it came to have that very negative meaning. In a similar way, Apocrypha originally had a, a positive meaning of secret or at least a neutral meaning of secret. And then over time, it came to have a negative meaning. So to give you an example of this idea, in English, we have the word occult. That has a very negative meaning, but that basically means the same thing as secret. So in, in the way past, occult just meant secret or hidden things. Now it came to mean the secret arts, the, the, the you know, the, the mysteries, and all the very negative things. So it's the same kind of basic idea that happened there. Um, hold on a second. Okay, so yeah, so basically, Originally, apocrypha was a positive term, it became a negative term. So now I'm going to also be discussing some other things about this. Let me see here. Okay, so one of the biggest arguments used in support of the Protestant canon is this idea that God would not have allowed the scriptures to be lost, to to he, God would have made it so that his word would reach us. So the basic idea is Protestants say, we can't be missing books from the Bible, because if we were, then that would show that God wasn't powerful enough to get his word to us. I've heard this argument time and time again. And also there's this idea of, well, there can't be any errors in the Bible, because if there are, then, then uh, God wasn't able to get his word to us perfectly. But this is a very faulty reasoning. First of all, we can show right from the Bible itself that it's wrong. We turn to Second Kings and Second Chronicles. I don't remember the exact chapter numbers, but it's near the end. It's in the 30s, I think. Of, it's in the 30s of Chronicles and 30s or 20s in, in Second Kings as well. And it's the story of Josiah. Josiah, the, what happened according to these two books, so we have two witnesses, two witnesses here, of... Josiah was trying to restore the people, to restore Israel, and to build it up, to make reforms, and, and he had people go into the temple, and they were looking for something, and, or they were trying to, I think, they were trying to do uh, some reforms to the building structure or something, if I remember correctly. But so anyways, they had another reason for being there, but someone found, I think it was the prophetess, or one of the priests, found the book of the law. Now that's a term in scripture that's referring to the law of Moses, and most scholars agree that it's talking about the book of Deuteronomy, or the original version. As we discussed in other teachings, that original version was probably the Temple Scroll, and not our copies of Deuteronomy, so it was an older version of Deuteronomy. But so, this book of the law that was found, they brought it to Josiah, and they said, look what we found. We found the book of the law, and they start. They, he, they start reading this book of the law to Josiah, and then he starts weeping because of what's in there. Because he realizes, wow, we were missing so much of the law. We we're missing the law. How could this have happened? How could we have lost some of His word? Here it is. It's being restored to us. So basically, the Bible tells us that he found the book of the law. Now, the word "find" or "found" implies that it wasn't previously known where it was, so it was lost. So that right there, in and of itself, proves that idea is false. Then you've got this other thing where, throughout the Middle Ages, the vast 
majority of the people couldn't even read, and uh, they they had to listen to the Bible being read in church. And then you have you have other places to this very day that still don't have a translation of a Bible in their own language, and they still don't have the Bible. So was God not powerful to get His word to those people? I guess He wasn't. He wasn't powerful enough, according to according to the Christian argument, the Protestant argument. If he couldn't get his word to all people, then apparently he's not powerful enough. But this this idea is really silly. It just it, it refutes itself. The, the, the idea is, you know, we, we have free will. He gives us scripture, but what do we do with the scripture? That's the key. If we, you know, if if uh, if you have your parents and and your parents get you a nice car, they get you a house, they pay for they pay for your college, they do all this stuff. And then what do you do? You total the car, you burn down your house, you fail every class in your college, or you get kicked, you get banned from that college and you can never go back because you did horrible things there. Well, now everything you had is lost. Is that your parents' fault? No. Because even your parents might have been able to, to do all kinds of crazy things to prevent you from doing stuff. They might have... They might have put uh, some special system in place to, like, if you were starting to burn your house down, there would be a sprinkler system, so immediately shut it off. Uh, but many times, the children don't want to be baby, and so the parents, on behalf of their children, step step aside, stand back, and say, "Okay, you wanna you wanna do things your way, or fine, do things your way." And he steps, the parents step back, and that's what, exactly what we see God doing, Yahuwah doing. He steps back. How do we know this? Because he's been stepping back for a long time. We we've, we've been in uh, we haven't been seeing a lot of his work compared to what he used to do in the times of the Bible. And with Israel, what happened with, with his work with Israel throughout the Bible? He was doing all kinds of stuff for Israel all the time. They they went into exile, but only for seventy years. He brought them back. But then when they went into exile that second time, they were in exile almost two thousand years from all the time of the first century to last century, and some are still in exile today. And there's no temple, no priesthood, so where is God? What, what, what happened? Where are all the miracles that? Where are the prophets of the Old Testament? A lot has changed because he stepped back. Atheists, there are many atheists today, and one of their thing, one of the things that they say is, I would believe God if he, if he would appear to me and talk to me or something. So they don't, they don't see God. And God could easily appear to these atheists and tell them, I, it's me, but he doesn't want to. He's, he's holding himself back because they don't deserve him to help them out in this because they're not humbling themselves. They, so it's the same thing with us. He treats all people the same. He shows no favoritism. So if we reject him and push him away, then he's not going to do as much to help us. Uh, so if we take his word and say we don't want his word, throw it away, well then we lost his word because we rejected it. And there's some passages of scripture which talk about how his words will last forever and will not be will not be uh, lost. And people say, okay, well, that right there shows that the Bible, as we have it, has to be the, the correct word. Uh, there's two things with that that doesn't make sense. Is the other side I could make the same argument. Like, in other words, the Greek churches, the Greek churches, their Old Testament has many, many differences in extra books. So they could, from their perspective, they could make the same argument. They say, uh, I'm working on it. God made sure to get his word to us. He wouldn't want us to have the wrong Bible, so he, he made sure to get us the Bible that we have. But their Bible that they have is has very many different books. Uh, one, one of the major things that refutes this narrow opinion of the Protestants is that every other church has other books as part of their Bible. Not just Catholics. And the Catholics, that's a huge portion of the church. But then, not just Catholics, but the Eastern Orthodox, they went away from the Catholic Church 500 years before the Protestants, and yet they had extra books, too. And the Oriental Orthodox Churches, they went before the Protestants a thousand years. They left the Catholic Church a thousand years before the Protestants did, and yet all those churches have extra books in their Bibles. So why is it all these other churches have extra books, and the Protestants think that their Bible is special? Why is the Protestant Bible special? when it didn't, didn't exist for the first 1,500 years of Christianity. It's this really warped way of thinking that's very 
me focused when you're not looking at the bigger picture of history and what other people perspective what their perspectives are. You're only thinking from your narrow-minded perspective when you're only thinking like, uh, and so also the church fathers, the early church fathers, they quoted from all different kinds of books and called them scripture. Shepherd of Hermas was quoted by Origen and Irenaeus and many other early church fathers of scripture and there was a whole bunch of other ones that, was quote, that were quoted outside of the Protestant Bible. So we've got church fathers, pretty much all the church fathers in the early times were putting extra stuff as scripture. And you've got a majority of all Bibles that have ever existed uh, before the printing press had extra books in them. And so the, the origin of the Protestant Bible did not really come until much later. And so we can't take that as the original Bible if we can't show evidence that it existed in early times. Um, so let's see here. Also, in the early church, there was, there was, okay, one, one of the arguments people, Protestants use, for example, to support the idea of, uh, of extra books uh, not being part of the canon, they, they make an argument that says only books which are universally accepted as scripture by all the churches can be accepted as scripture. First of all, that's nowhere stated in scripture. That's their own reasoning that, that that's a basis for what is and is not scripture. Never does it say that all the churches have to accept that scripture in order for it to be scripture. That's never stated anywhere. That's their own ideas. And we've got plenty of churches which have their own unique ways of approaching the canon. Some reject the writings of Paul. Of course, then the, then the Protestants will say, okay, well, those aren't real Christians. So then it becomes a very circular reasoning of, okay, who's the real Christians? Well, only the real Christians are the ones, apparently, who accept the same books as the Protestants. So it's very circular reasoning here. And um, so basically, but by their own standard, some of the New Testament books cannot be accepted, and some of the Old Testament books cannot be accepted in the canon, because in ancient times, there was not a universal consensus. We have evidence from the church fathers and from Jewish rabbis that in ancient times, uh, books of the Old Testament were doubted, like the Book of Esther, that was one of the big ones, and then all, some uh, other books, like Book of Ecclesiastes, Book of Proverbs, and... Song of Solomon. These were all books which were doubted by people and rejected by some Jewish groups and some Christian groups as well. There's lists of canons of the Bible by church fathers, and some of them do not include the book of Esther. And uh, so I, I think that's Melito's canon, and that's one that Protestants often appeal to, Melito's canon. They say Melito's canon is evidence for the Protestant Bible. And yet that same canon has some extra books in it. Melito's canon has some extra books. And it does not have the Book of Esther in it. So can we appeal to Melito's canon as proof of what the Protestant canon, it, that being the correct canon? Well, no, because that is contradicts a Protestant canon. Then there's this idea that, like, uh, a lot of Christians have this idea that the Bible was settled at a council. There was a council that settled it all, and usually they think it's true. Constantine, Thank you. but there really is no evidence of Constantine uh, establishing a canon. Very little evidence. The, the Council of Nicaea, a lot of people say stuff that happened at that Nicene Council, but there's actually not a lot of evidence of what happened at that council. Because the basically for each council, there was often like a, a minutes or a description of what was discussed in in a like actual preserved doc for the Nicene Council. We don't have that. We only have a summary of some of what was discussed, but it's not like the official record of we discussed this, 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 this. So a lot of scholars are not sure everything that was discussed in the Nicene Council. And people come up with all these kind of conspiracy theories and they try to blame everything on Constantine, but what we see is that the canon did not originate with Constantine. It was a much more complicated and prolonged process of what we have today is the res end result of a very long process of 
hundreds of years of churches arguing and debating over things. Basically, in the in the fourth century, the church father Eusebius or Eusebius, however you pronounce his name, he was one of he was the uh, one of the chief advisors, I think, of Constantine Eusebius, and he writes that not all churches accept these books. Uh, some some churches don't accept Hebrews, James, Jude, to computer, the Revelation. Uh, he, he mentioned other books. So basically we see right there, he's telling us that the canon uh, differed uh, through through the different churches. And this is this is Constantine's head man. And so th there's just so much evidence of a lack of unity in the early church. So was God not powerful enough to clarify what his word is? If he was, the, the early churches should have known like that. Oh yeah, that, that's the Bible and everything else that would reject. But as we see when we study these ancient writings and history, it's much more complicated than what Protestants narrow my view on this is. Um, one of the arguments used is that the, the Apocrypha was not written in Hebrew, therefore it cannot be scripture. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls prove that's not true. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and some of the Apocrypha was found there, and it was in Hebrew, the Book of Tobit. That's part of the Apocrypha, and, and that's right there in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In five copies, one of them Hebrew and four of them copies were Aramaic. But there are so many writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls, extra writings, and they were in Hebrew. The Book of Jubilees, now Enoch was in Aramaic. Aramaic is a sister language to Hebrew, and so even some of the Bible itself in the Old Testament is in Aramaic, like the Book of Daniel and Ezra. So we've got we've got a lot of evidence that the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially of these apocrypha being in Hebrew. Then also we've got evidence of the Dead Sea Scrolls to prove to us that there were Jews who accepted the apocrypha. Some Protestants like to say that. These extra books are not scripture because the Jews don't accept these as scripture. But they're only talking about a very minor group of Jews, or I shouldn't say minor group of Jews, but one group of Jews as compared to the whole group of Jews that once existed. They're talking about those Pharisees, those rabbinic Jews. And those Jews had that minor canon of mainly just the books of the regular Tanakh that everyone's familiar with. Genesis through Malachi. The Jews order those books differently, so it ends with Second Chronicles, but it's the same; those same books. And so, uh, but the Dead Sea Scrolls proves that those were not the only books that were accepted by Jews. Uh, they were the basically the Essenes, who were represented by the Dead Sea Scroll writings. It's clear from that evidence that those, like tons of extra books, were accepted by the Jews. And an example. To support this notion is Second Ezra. Many people do not accept Second Ezra in scripture. They don't think it's authentic. It was pseudepigraphic. In other words, they believe it was not written by Ezra. But even if, even if they're, they're right and it was not written by Ezra, it is proof that there were Jews, and probably a significant number, who accepted other books. Because in Second Ezra, it commands to whoever's reading it, it speaks of Ezra writing 94 books of scripture and 24 books should be shared with everybody and 70 books of scripture are to be kept secret. So unless the writer of Second Andrews was just making things up knowing that no one cares about it, no one follows it, he clearly must have wrote it for an audience that he wanted to follow and accept the message of that book. And that message, the book, the book's message was 70 books are apocryphal, secret, not to be shared with everybody, only with the worthy, it says in Second Andrews, and but the 24 books shared with everybody. Now, the Protestants will tell you those traditional apocrypha of the Catholic Bible are not scripture. We cannot make doctrine from them. But they are useful for studying and learning from. That's what you'll see in the Book of Common Prayer, the Protestant Book of Common Prayer. And so uh, when, when you look at those books listed, one of those books is Second Ezra, as the books that is useful to read and should, you should look at. But don't take it as doctrine, they, they say, but you should read it. So at the very least, we have Protestant, the, at least the early Protestants saying, read it. You should be studying this so you know what it says. Because the Jews uh, had this understanding. Uh, it, it helps you understand what the Jews thought at that time. 
And that the King James Version, so many people are like, there's a lot of King James only people in Protestants. And the King James Version in the original one had the Apocrypha as part of the Bible. In a similar way, probably of not on the same level of authority, but you guys should study these writings. Because the church has been using these writings for over a thousand years, so you guys should study these writings. That was what the King James Version was for. So, for any Protestants who might uh, be questioning these things and say, it's not even worth it to read these things, well, they should look to their Protestant forefathers who said, read this stuff, study it. And so, let's see, um, now, I also want to mention how one of the best ways to to prove that this concept is completely false is from the Bible itself, because the Bible never once gives us a list. It give us a list of what books are scripture. It does not say that only the books in the Bible are scripture. It's all these doctrines of men that are coming up. Where did they get these doctrines from? It's just the church tradition that we've been seeing. And so, when we actually look at what the Bible has to tell us, there's some very interesting things which prove the exact opposite. But before I say that, I just want to say one other thing. Uh, there are so many errors and contradictions in the books of the Bible that we have. Uh, so when Protestants say that extra books cannot be scripture because they have so many errors, falsehoods in them, or immoral teachings, well, there's a very circular reasoning going on here because... Uh, anything that's not part of the Bible, they have a high bar of skepticism. But if it's in the Bible, they have a very low bar. So, if it's in the Bible, they'll use all kind of reasoning to explain away errors and contradictions. But if it's outside the Bible, they'll just accept it as face value. Oh, that's a contradiction, that's an error, that's a false, it's evil teaching. So they're implying a very inconsistent and unfair approach and standard of evaluation. And then also, um, uh, hold on a second. Um, but so I, I lost my train of thought there for a second. But uh, so there's con there's contradictions and errors. Like one of them is uh, in the Bible. There is you guys should look at this when you when you can sometime. Ezra and Nehemiah. Look at those two books, and you're going to find in those two books there's a list. It's, in, it's the same list in both, so it's a copy of the same list from both books. Just like the three Gospels that we have, have very, they overlap in detail and content, but they have a lot of differences. So also, Ezra and Nehemiah have the same list, but so many errors and contradictions when comparing the two. So take a look at the list of exiles, two books. You'll see they're most of the same names, but some of the names differ, and then also the numbers are different. They, they differ too in radically different ways, contradicting each other so bad. Uh, but but these people will use all kinds of reasoning to say, okay, that's not a contradiction, it's not an error. They'll do all kinds of silly stuff, and then also uh, they they say the apocrypha is not scripture because it's teaching immoral things. But then what do they say? They say, how do we know what's immoral? What the Bible tells us is immoral is immoral. That's what they say. So you can see here they're saying. Okay, well that's not in the Bible, and the Bible says this is immoral, so those books cannot be scripture. Uh, but if those book, if those books are part of the Bible, just not included in yours, but if they're if they're scripture, then what they say is also an indication of what is and is not moral or immoral. So the idea of what morality is is determined by the Bible. But you're going to judge which books uh, should be in the Bible, uh, like because of them being immoral, it doesn't make sense. It, you know, it's uh, it's contradicting itself. Because if if that book were part of the Bible, if that was in your Bible, then you'd be using all sorts of reasoning to say, okay, well it's in the Bible, so that's telling the truth of morality. It seems like it contradicts this other passage about morality, but no, it probably doesn't. So I'm going to try to. Make it interpret it in a way that it all works together. It makes sense. This is what people do. They apply very unfair reasoning. It's the same thing with dating methods. How they, they date the books of scripture. So what do Protestants say about uh, when when was the law of Moses written? Well, that was written by Moses in uh, 1400 BC. About 
And when was Isaiah, you know, when, when was Daniel written? Oh yeah, that was written 400s, 500s AD, or excuse me, BC. Uh, yeah, that was written by Daniel. But then, when it's books outside the Bible, they, they were like, what? Skeptic bar, raise up now, and now they jump and follow, you know, like, mindlessly, they follow what the scholars say about all the other books outside the Bible. Like for the Book of Enoch, they parrot, they parrot the scholarship uh, information about the Book of Enoch. The scholars, this was mainly established in the 19th, 20th century, uh, I think more like the 19th century, by R. H. Charles and other people like him, and they argued with their arguments. There was five books uh, in the Book of Enoch, five different authors, all different times that they were written in, and that opinion has uh, been the mainstream since it originated. But you can bet you that pretty much all Protestants who parrot that information about the Book of Enoch having that scholarship are just copying what those scholars say. Uh, if, that, if those scholars in the in the previous century had said had said there was only four authors, then you'd hear the Protestants say that there was four authors of it. Or if, if they had said it, Enoch was written in 300 BC, they'd say oh, it was written in 300 BC. If they said it was 100 BC, they'd, they'd say okay, it was written in 100 BC. They don't even question or investigate what the scholars are saying about these books. Now, of course, not every Protestant is like that, so you can't make a 100% universal generalization, because I was a Protestant at the time when I started accepting some of these extra books, because I went through that journey of process. So, you know, there are some exceptions to this, but for the most part, Protestants don't even investigate this stuff on their own. They just kind of accept what the scholars say when it's not in their Bible. But when it's books in the Bible, then all of a sudden they say, oh, no, 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 the scholars are wrong about that. So, the, like, for instance, the book of Daniel, the, the scholarship consensus about, uh, about the book of Daniel was that it is, at, it is uh, written in the 2nd century B.C., not by Daniel, but long after Daniel. Of course, Protestants reject that idea, and I also don't accept that idea. But I'm, I try to be consistent with this approach, whereas, you know, I also don't accept the scholarly views on a lot of things, and I test everything they say. Now, I might not be correct about everything I do, but I test everything they say. And I don't accept what their opinions are until I look at it myself first, on every issue, not just the skippers, but so many other issues, too. But we don't see this being done by people who claim that the Bible, that the 66 books alone are scripture, they just follow whatever these scholars are saying, and it's very disturbing to me to, to see such mindlessness in, in, in the church. And the Catholic Church, unfortunately, they have their closed-mindedness. They have the tradition approach, where they say, well, my church does not have these books in my, in my Bible, so I can't, you can't, it's not true, because I trust the church. It's a very, like, the Roman Catholic Church is very, you must follow the church, what it says, or you're a heretic, or something like that. So, there's all sorts of biases these people have, which prohibit them from seeing what Scripture says. Uh, but I'll, I'll, Jackson mentioned Liberty University, and I went to Liberty University for one semester. That's an evangelical Baptist college, and that kind of same type of stuff. Basically, uh, earlier that year, in 2009, at the beginning of the year, I was still in high school, 12th grade, and I started because I was studying the scriptures instead of doing my homework, and I was studying through and saying, wait a minute, the Bible says Enoch is scripture. What do you mean Enoch is scripture? What else is scripture? And my, everyone in my church was like, this, not disowning me, but they were thinking I was crazy or going off the deep end. I go to Liberty University, and I, I'm telling everybody about this stuff, and people also think I'm crazy there too. One of my friends actually <laughs> doesn't think I'm crazy, that I met at Liberty University, and I'm still friends with him to this day. On Facebook, uh, he he ended up leaving too. But uh, so I've had a very long journey uh, through studying these extra books and trying to be open to things. And what I found is that the my approach came from okay, if the Bible says that this is scripture, I'm going to follow the Bible, even if every other church got it wrong. One of the arguments I hear people use is the churches you you the, there can't be other books because that would have to mean that all the other churches got it wrong. Are you willing to say that all churches got it wrong? How could you say that? Yes. 
Well, yes. First of all, many of you agree with the idea that the law of Moses is still to be kept. And so that, that right there shows they got that wrong. A lot of churches pretty much, not all of them, but most of them teach against the law of Moses being kept anymore today. So they got that wrong. So that means they could easily have got another step wrong. Protestants, what do they say? Well, they say the whole Catholic Church was wrong, and that was the majority of the Church for such a long time. Well, if the Catholic Church got so many things wrong, why are they taking their Bible from the Catholic Church? Most of the books of the Protestant Bible are basically just the Catholic Bible. Just they threw out a couple extra books, uh, but otherwise they, they copied from the Catholics. So uh, it's just... There's a lot of bad reasoning going on here. So basically, what, what are you going to follow? You're going to follow humans, mankind, who all humans agree that man has erred so much on things and gotten so many things wrong. Protestants think the Catholic Church was thoroughly corrupt and that pretty much almost everything they were saying was really bad stuff. So it's like, if the Church could have been so bad as the Protestants say it was, then it's easily the case that the Protestants are also just as bad, or even perhaps worse, who knows? So, it's just this cognitive dissonance and the very difficult thing to admit you're wrong. And it's a very scary thing to say that, okay, we don't have all of God's word. Because, why? Because it's such a comforting thing to think that, oh, this is all God's word, everything I need for my salvation is in this book. <sighs> I'm good, I'm safe. But if that's not true, if there are some things you need for salvation which are not in the Bible, or if there's other information that you don't have, uh, then that starts making you scared. And so there's a reason why people don't want to accept that. Um, but so the New Testament quotes from the, the scriptures, and many times the quotes don't match anything in our Bible. So it proves the, the New Testament writers are quoting something very different from what we have either extra books of scripture or a version of the Old Testament which had major differences from our copies. The Dead Sea Scrolls prove that there have been major differences in the scriptures, major changes. Septuagint proves major changes have been made. The Septuagint is Greek manuscripts of the Bible which exist, uh, which are very old and come even before the, the Masoretic, the Hebrew manuscripts that we have. Most of the Hebrew manuscripts are of a very late date whereas the Septuagint, a lot of the manuscripts come earlier than the the Hebrew manuscripts that we have. Dead Sea Scrolls only proceed the Septuagint. And those Dead Sea Scrolls show us so much compelling evidence that we have in our Bibles is very corrupt, <clears throat> in error, and just has been had many changes over time. And then translation issues. There's so many different translations. Well, the fact that there's they keep coming up with new translations implies that other translations are viewed as inferior or flawed in some sense. Why would they keep making another translation if they didn't think of oh, previous translations were bad or flawed in some way? So this idea of making new translations shows right there that they don't think the Word of God is sufficient in its current form. Because that's why they, they feel the need to make a new translation. Now, I'm going to be showing from the Bible itself that there are indeed other books part of the Bible which are not in our Bibles. And that's that was enough for me. Seeing what the Bible said about it was enough. Because I knew that the Bible was more authoritative than all the churches and Christians combined. And I'd rather follow the Bible, what it has to say, and what the apostles have to say, than what random bishops, random pastors, random Christians have to say about this. So, uh, let me read now. Hold on, let me see if there's anyone trying... Uh, okay, uh, I'm just checking to see if anyone was trying to come on it in. Um, yeah, I think some people got the time wrong. Oh well. But so I'm gonna read now from. I pulled a couple of quotations. There's so many more. I, I've done teaching him uh, on the canon before, and I had this huge, exhaustive thing about showing all the places in the Bible where it supports active books. That kind of teaching is such a long teaching. I'm not going to doing that, but we can do that in some future time again. Um, but I have a, select, a selection of a few verses, which I'm going to be reading from, just to give you that the basic introduction to how the scriptures, uh, the scriptures themselves, tell us that there's other books that should be part of the Bible, which are not part of our Bibles. So first, before I read these things, I want to establish some concepts here. Divinely inspired 
prophecy prophet. Okay. A prophet or prophecy is divinely inspired. It comes from the spirit. The spirit is inspiring the information. And um, yeah, there's a password to get in, so try to make sure they have that password to come in. Uh, so divinely inspired, it, that indicates that it's inspired by the divine one, the, the deity, our creator. How did he inspire it? What does divine inspiration mean? It means uh, putting words in that person's heart or mind or spirit so that they can write it down the message of what Yahuwah wants to tell them. It can be some type of message of rebuking, repentance, but it's, you know, in the scriptures we see, thus says Yahuwah, or in the regular Bibles, thus says the Lord, the Lord God of Israel, and things like that. So the idea is it's divinely inspired. This comes, it's the very words of God himself. Um, and so, if it's written down, and it's divinely inspired, it's a divinely inspired writing, okay? It's a divinely inspired writing. If the words are divinely inspired and prophetic, you write them down, it's a divinely inspired prophetic writing. The word scripture in Hebrew, in English, in the older English, and in Greek and in Latin, it all means word, uh, writing. Scripture means writing. It's related to the word scribe. A scribe scribes something out. Or a script. It scripts something out. So the scripture or a script. You know, uh, they talk about a movie script. That's actually just writing. And so, scripture, in its original meaning, just means the writing, or scriptures, the writings. But just like when you say the, like in Greek, in Greek, uh, when, when you talk about, when you talk about the creator, say, you, you, you often don't say theos, God, you say the God. Because you're saying, and when you say the, it's saying the ultimate one. When you say the writings, don't just mean any other, any regular things, but you mean no, it's the ultimate writings, the writings that come from God, the divinely inspired writings. So that's why they called it scripture, the scriptures, the writings. And so when we see what is scripture, the idea is what is divinely inspired writing. And it's clear, it's prophetic, and it's written down, then it must be scripture. But then these people have this idea, well, it sh maybe it's scripture, but it shouldn't be in the Bible. Well, that if it's scripture, divinely inspired, and that's supposed to be in the Bible, does it really matter if it's not in the Bible or not? Because if it's divinely inspired, it doesn't matter if it's in the Bible, it's up to the same authority, because it's his word, it's his prophecy. So once you start trying to parse words like that, by saying like, okay, well, even if it's scripture, it shouldn't be in the Bible, it shouldn't be used for doctrine or something, it doesn't make sense to say that. Because if it's, if it's divinely inspired, we should be using it no matter where it is, even if it's not in our Bibles, as long as it's his words. It's the same inspiration. And that's what the Bible itself says in Second Peter. It says, all prophecy is God-breathed. And does not come from private interpretation. And it's, uh, but it comes from the Holy Spirit, the inspiration of the Spirit. So, so I'm going to read now uh, some of these passages, which could clearly show for two things. It shows that there's other books which are scripture, divinely inspired writings, not in the Bible. And that there is something very strange and suspicious that happened. I'll, I'll explain when I, once I read these things. I'm going to read the verses first, and then I'll share my interpretation. First Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 29 to 30. Read, Now the acts of King David, first and last, indeed they are written in the book of Samuel the seer, in the book of Nathan the prophet, and in the book of Gad the seer, with all his reign and his might, and the events that happened to him, to Israel, and to all the kingdoms of the lands. Second Chronicles 9, 29, uh, chapter 20, uh, excuse me, yeah, chapter 9, verses 29. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet, in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite, and in the visions of Ido the seer concerning Jeroboam the son of Nebat? Second Chronicles 12, 15. The Acts of Rehoboam, first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemaiah the prophet, and of Ido the seer, concerning genealogies? Second Chronicles 13, 22. Now the rest of the Acts of Abijah, his ways and his sayings, are written in the annals of the prophet Ido. Second Chronicles 33, 32. Now the rest of the Acts of Hezekiah and his goodness, indeed they are written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, and in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Then Second Chronicles 35. Prepare yourselves according to your father's houses, according to your divisions, following the written instruction of David, king of Israel, and the written instruction of Solomon's son. 
And then 1 Kings 4, 29 to 34. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezrahite, and Heman, Chalco, and Darda, the sons of Mehol. And his fame was in all the Sumerian nations. He spoke three thousand proverbs, and his songs were one thousand and five. Also he spoke of trees from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish, and of men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth, who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So those are the passages I will read right now. And basically, what those pro passages prove to us is that, first of all, those books are scripture, because it's, it's telling us, the Bible says, if you want to know more information about this, go to these books, because these books are trustworthy. They wouldn't lead us to false writings, or writings which are, are lead, teaching us false information. So, so they say, if you want more information about this, go to these writings and you'll find out more. And then the writings it tells us to go to, the book of Samuel the prophet, Nathan the prophet, Gad the prophet, Shemaiah the prophet, Ido the prophet, uh, all these prophets wrote books? Where are the books? Solomon, wait, what, what did Solomon do? Solomon did 1,005 songs? We've got one song of Solomon and it's about sex. What happened to all those other songs? They were, according to what that passage said from First Kings, it said that all those songs, let me see, it said, uh, it said God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding. His wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men. So basically, and then it cites that he wrote, he did 3,000 Proverbs and his songs were 1,005. Based on context, it's clearly implying that these Proverbs and songs are a chief testimony and witness of his wisdom which is greater than all other men's wisdom. So all these amazing songs had so much amazing wisdom, greater than all men at men's wisdom. And yet they're gone. What happened to these books? What happened to all the books of these prophets? What happened to Ido's book and Ahijah and Shemaiah and Nathan Gad and Samuel's books? They wrote books according to this. What happened to these books? Is it just a coincidence that they're not here anymore? How could they just get lost? The reason they got lost is because the Jews rejected those books, they threw them out and stopped reading them. Why would they do that? Because they didn't like what it said. They didn't agree with the message that was in it. So it, we, we have, we have to realize what books are out there that were preserved. Josephus, we have lots of manuscripts of Josephus, hundreds of manuscripts of Josephus preserved by scribes over the over thousands of years. We have manuscripts of Homer, the pagan Homer, even preserved by Christians. Preserved by Christians who rejected those myths as pagan. The writings of Homer, there's so many manuscripts of and you know the Iliad and the Odyssey. And uh, why do they you know they preserved all these writings. Why wouldn't the Jews and the Christians preserve these amazing writings that the Bible talks about? And all these men wrote, and yet they're, they're gone. Wouldn't, you know, the Bible tells us that these books were written, so we know that they were written. So the question is, you know, what would you give to read those writings? I would give almost anything to read these writings. Like, how could they just become gone? But these other books didn't become gone? That can't be a coincidence. It has to be intentional. The loss of these books is intentional. And the only way it can be intentional is if people decided not to include those books for some reason. But uh, if those books were valid and actually written by them, and we know the Bible says that they were, so if they were written by who they say they were written by, then they should have preserved them. And yet they didn't, which suggests that there is something suspicious that happened, which made them no longer preserve it. We have good news, though. The book of Gad has been found and is going to be published in the next few years into English translation. It was found in a Hebrew manuscript amongst some Jews in Yemen. And so that's going to be published. I've already read, I've already read some of it myself. I, I have a, I have a overview of the entire thing, a, a, uh, outline of the whole thing. And, uh, and so that's going to be amazing when that, when that comes out. And there's also, apparently they also had the book of Shemaiah and Ahijah. And was it Nathan? No, I think Shemaiah and Ahijah, they had, those books as well, but we don't know where they are now, but those same Jews had those books, uh, according to some testimonies. In the Middle Ages, they had them, apparently. 
happened. So uh, we may find those books sometime in the next hundred years, hopefully. But so all those references prove that there's other books that were that are now lost, which were prophetic and thus scripture, divinely inspired. But now, now what else do we have? We have in the letter of Jude. Jude wrote a letter to the churches, and what was his letter? It was to defend the faith once and for all, and to protect them against heresies. Okay, and so he only had he took one chapter to write this. And yet he decided to, the only quotations in his book were from Apocrypha writings. Let's look at what they are. The first, well, one, one of them is the one from the book of Enoch. He says, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So right there, that's Jude chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. And that clearly says that these words were spoken by Enoch himself. Because it says Enoch, the seventh from Adam. So the, what does that mean, the seventh generation from Adam? He's, Jude's clearly telling us he believed that Enoch wrote, wrote and prophesied this. He says Enoch prophesied about these men, saying these words, and then he quotes from the book of Enoch. So he's clearly saying that the book of Enoch is the words of Enoch that Enoch prophesied those many generations ago. He says in the letter, long ago these, these men were marked out for condemnation. Long ago, meaning in the time of Enoch. And Jude 1.9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. According to the church fathers, that's a quotation from Moses' apocryphal book called The Assumption of Moses. Here's the thing. Uh, why would why would uh, Jew be quoting a book he thinks is fiction? Why would he be quoting a book he thinks is fiction? It doesn't make sense. He, he's quoting a book. Uh, like It'd be like quoting... Um, it'd be like if I wrote a book in, pretending to be Enoch. If I wrote a book to pretend to be Enoch, and then I decided to quote from it as if Enoch actually said it, like, let's say I write a book that says, okay, Enoch says, you must eat cheese every day or you will go to hell. And then I write, I write a letter and then I quote what I, you know, my, the fake writing and Enoch prophesied, saying, you must eat cheese every day for the rest of your life or you go to hell. And therefore, uh, vegans will go to hell. Or something like that. You know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, the idea of quoting a fiction which you know is fiction but talking about it as if it actually happened is nonsense or talking about it as an authority doesn't make sense and yet that's what we see Jude doing apparently according to these church people he's quoting from fake books that were written, that have no authority in their mind that doesn't make sense what makes sense is he believed that Enoch prophesied it just as he said and that the Michael the archangel actually said those words to Satan disputing with the body of Moses. And that's not in our Bibles because Jude didn't have the Bible in the 66. There was no Bible of 66 that he had. Remember, Revelation had not even been written at that time yet. So they did not have all the Bible in one little thing. And the Bible, in those times, they didn't have the Bible in one small compartment thing because it was so hard to, to carry it. The book, the book form of scripture was only starting to come into existence. They were still writing on scrolls. So they would carry scrolls of all the different books. They did not have all the books together in one little compact book. The writings of Paul were separate letters being circulated. They weren't in a nice little book, the, the letters of Paul. They weren't all like that. It, it, that only came later, hundreds, hundreds of years later. And so, uh, okay, it's, uh, there's a lot of evidence here from the Bible itself. That it says Enoch prophesied. Now, uh, I quoted earlier from... Second Chronicles, I said, Second Chronicles 33, says, Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness, indeed they are written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, and in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. What we find is that that's the book of Isaiah and the book of Kings, First and Second Kings. It has the exact information that it's talking about, uh, what it's talking about, the acts of Hezekiah. And so you see here, that Chronicles makes no distinction in how it quotes these books. It says, now the rest of the acts of this are written in the prophecy of Samuel and Gad and Now the rest of the acts of this guy are written in the book of Isaiah. 
in the book of Kings, there's no distinction. There's no way of the writer making a distinction between Scripture 66 and not Scripture. You know, they're quoting them in the same way at the same level of authority. So if you read the Bible with an unbiased mind, you will never get an idea from it that only the 66 are the Bible and God's Word. You only get that idea from tradition, the assumption that these books have to be everything that we need. And the fact is, people think there can't be errors in the Bible, because if there were, then that means God didn't get his word to us. But the fact is, there are errors. You have to come to that conclusion and realization if you're honest and open-minded and true. When you come to that realization, you have two choices to make. Are you going to reject the faith, you're going to reject the Bible and become either another religion or an atheist, as so many have done? People who become atheists, many times because they see all these problems with the Bible, and they see the Protestants' reactions and denial of it, and they find it hypocritical and foolish and dumb, and they say, okay, we don't want any part of this. So they go away and reject the whole faith. <clears throat> Or you can go the option that I and some others have gone, and we say, okay, you know what? It's, it's unsettling, but I'm going to accept what the scriptures say, and I'm going to, I, I agree that there's some things that are in error in the scripture, but I'm going to try to find the truth. I'm going to find it, try to find the, the original pure message. And so we don't reject the scriptures. We continue to cling to them and try to find the original message. And I want to emphasize, if you see my other teachings, you will see that I don't mean to say that we can't appeal to the scriptures as authoritative or to prove things. But my point is, you can't just look at a passage and say, okay, the Bible says it, therefore it has to be true 100%. Rather, you say, okay, the Bible says it, I, it, it has to be true unless you have some other evidence to show that it's not true, or to show that that's an, an error. So we, we should use the scriptures as if it's authoritative until we can prove that there's another authority that shows that what that says is not correct. So I still use the scripture as authority. Just there are other authorities too, but it's not scripture alone. We have to use our reasoning ability, discernment, spirit of discernment. Yes, sir. And so it's very difficult sometimes, but you just gotta keep trying to follow it through. And uh, now let me see. People were asking some questions. Let me see. Uh, um, Jonathan asked if I had a list on a page anywhere. Are you talking about a list of extra books, or I don't know what, what list you refer to. Well, anyway, yeah, yeah. not a list of the books, but a list of the scriptures you read off. He has a list. Um, right. Right. The, list the list of books that I consider scripture, I can I can share that list. Um, uh, and then Jackson asks, what's in the book of Gad? You didn't give us enough um, there. You give us a little more on the book here. of Gad. Hold on, I can tell you. You said you read part of it. Let, let me pull up the overview right now. Tell you what's We're about done, book. everybody. Um, one second while that page loads. He he released three chapters. Okay, he list he listed he released three chapters. The translator and he also released an overline and an outline full thing. So here's the outline. He says chapter one is sixty three verses. It's God's revelation to Gad the seer. The seer sees animals, the sun and the moon, and all that happens is interpreted by the voice of how the lamb is sacrificed on the heavenly altar, but not before he praises the Lord. Gad is told to tell David his revelation, and David blesses the Lord and congratulates Gad for the secret that God has told him. He shared that, so we can read that whole thing. Then verses 64 to 92, a second revelation to Gad concerning the last days. There is a prophecy of devastation on Edom that dwells in the land of Kittim. While quoting their anti-Jewish opinions, there will be a battle between Michael, the high prince, and Semael, prince of the world. He also released that. We can read that. Uh, verses 93 to 104. On Passover, a Moabite shepherd asks King David to convert him. David does not know what to do, and then it, and he asks the Lord. Nathan the prophet answers in the name of God, Moabite male, not Moabite female. The Moabite stays among David's shepherds, and his daughter, Sephira, becomes a concubine of Solomon. Uh, verses 105 to 120, a story that praises the nature of King David, the wise king. Verses 121 to 130, before a battle between the Philistines and Israel, the Lord speaks to Gad to tell David not to be frightened. That night, a fiery vehicle descends from heaven and smites the Philistines. Verses 131 to 141, God sends 
Gad, to tell David not to boast in his strength. David admits that all of his strength comes from God. God is satisfied with David's answer, and for that reason he decides that he will help the house of David forever. David counts the children of Israel. This is a recension which combines 2 Samuel 24 with 1 Chronicles 21. Both, bibl both biblical known texts, together with some additions, appear to be integral chapter in the book. He uh, That's released, but in, only in Hebrew. That's not in English. Then... Verses 178 to 198, God reveals himself to David, telling him he should speak to his people. David gathers the people and preaches to them concerning the Lord's names and titles. David urges his people not only to listen to the Torah, but to fulfill it as well. Verses 199 to 226, Hiram, king of Tyre, asks David to send his, his messengers to teach him Torah. David answers that Hiram ought to fear the Lord and to fulfill the commandments of the children of Noah. That's not talking about the Noahide laws. It's talking about uh, what the, the laws uh, that Noah spoke of in Jubilees, which is different. It's not the same thing as Noahide laws. Uh, then he goes on saying, A list of gods actually given, and the children of Israel are described as sealed of Shaddai. Hiram and his servants believe in Israel's election and praise Israel. God hears Hiram and sends Gad to tell David that Hiram and his people will prepare his house. Then verses 227 to 249 is Psalm 145. Verses 250 to 265 is Psalm 144. Verses 266 to 285 is before David dies, he urges his people to adhere to God that it will be good for them forever. And then there's two more chapters, uh, verses 286 to 353. It says this is, except for the first four verses, it is a long story where Tamar, King David's daughter, plays the role of a heroine. After Tamar was raped, she ran to Geshur, and later on, one of the king's servants tried to rape her. Tamar kills her attacker, and she comes back to Jerusalem, praised and blessed by King Solomon. And then, verses 354 to 375 of Revelation, Gad sees the Lord on his throne, judging his people on the first day of the year. The angel brings forward three books in which everyone's days are written. The Satan wants to prosecute Israel, but he is silenced by one of the angels. The Revelation contains all kinds of details, and the seer does not understand all of them. Revelation and the book end with a blessing by the seer, while an, ans while an angel answers, Amen, Amen. Oh, and the previous chapter, he also released. So three of the chapters are released, and two of the chapters are, are Psalms in our Bible, and one of the chapter is in Hebrew. So altogether, of the 14 chapters, um, we have like six of the chapters released. So almost half of the book we have in some form. May I ask you uh, one more question? One more question? So that's the overview of the book of God. Let me see if I have any more information to share with you about the canon. I ask, I'm going to, I think I'm going to have, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you guys, I'm going to have you guys ask questions on anything about, about the canon, and I'll share my thoughts on yeah, anything. If you guys are interested in that, I'm wondering about the book or, of Jasher. If you don't want to ask questions, but if you want me to quote from some other passages that the Bible is quoting from extra books from, then I can do that as well. So what do you guys want to do? Do you want me to um, have you guys ask questions or quote from some more stuff? Um, now, for Jackson mentions Jasher. And I used to be a believer in the book of Jasher. I used to accept it as scripture, and I accepted other books alongside Jasher, but then I started doing more study and I was finding that the Jasher was contradict, contradicting all these other books. And so the only way for Jasher to be scripture is if all these other books are fake writings by false prophets. So I had to think, okay, should I say all these writers are false prophets? Or that Jasher was not written as scripture, but that it was still a writing. Even if Jasher is not scripture, it does not mean that the writer was like uh, a false prophet or you know, because they weren't claiming to be any authority. It's uh, the the uh, you know they weren't claiming to be an authority. They were just writing an account of the history of an interpretation of the of the law and the book of Judges, uh, Joshua and Judges. Whereas these other books claim to be prophetic. So you have to say, okay, if Jasher's true, these books are fake prophets and false false prophecy. But if these books are valid, then Jasher is not scripture, but it's it's not false prophecy either. And that's the better way to approach it, because now you're not making accusations which you can't prove. And I also found evidence of uh, 
basically, Jasher has some really crazy stuff in it that's very unbelievable and kind of proved that the book cannot be valid. So uh, I'm gonna just finish up here and because uh, we'll have to end it now. Um, but so uh, Jasher, uh, from what I've seen. Is, if you read it, the whole thing, you'll see there's a lot of fairy tale like stuff in it. Uh, and so, I would advise don't waste your time with that book. And, uh, I'll tell you about that later. It, there's things in it that seem to like contradict with the law of ones itself. Just spend time studying it. And also, you guys should know that not all manuscripts. Of the Bible, quote, Jasher. Some manuscripts do not have that quotation, so it's very possible that that quotation was added later on by scribes, by rabbinic scribes, to support that book, um, like as a commentary, and then it, it got in there later on. And so, yeah, I think Jasher quotes the other writings, I believe, of Scripture and the New Testament. It contradicts the New Testament and some of the Old Testament. It has contradictions as well. But so, uh, Jackson Snyder says we have to end it now. So I want to say to to end it all, uh, there's so much more information about the canon. And uh, so you can contact me on Facebook. I have a YouTube channel. I have uh, information. Um... Yeah, and you know, uh, wait, Jackson, are you are you saying? Uh, yeah, I, I'm. Can you remember what you're saying? I'm not, uh, okay, you're saying I can continue with the other people if I want. Okay, sounds good. So everyone else in your group, thank you so much for listening and attending the the study. And I have more files and information. There's so much more information online. You can. You can email me or contact me through the other ways. And I have many other teachings as well that have been recorded. So, shalom, and I hope you have a wonderful time at Jackson's uh, event that you all are at. And I, I hope to make it at a future time to meet you guys. Good. Peace. Peace. That was a, that was a great seminar.